In this video, I shall be continuing the discussion on uterine pathologies. So last time, we spoke about polyps, adenomyosis, and fibroids. In this video, we shall be discussing endometrial cancer and congenital uterine abnormalities. So starting off with endometrial cancer first. Endometrial cancer is most commonly adenocarcinoma of columnar epithelial gland cells, basically in around 90% of cases. Endometrial cancer is the most common gynae malignancy, and it is the fourth most common malignancy in women in the UK. Now, the cause of endometrial cancer is most often related to excess estrogen. So when you have high levels of unopposed estrogen. Now, when we say unopposed, we mean that we don't have progesterone to counteract the effects of estrogen. Estrogen will result in proliferation of the endometrium, which can result in hyperplasia and malignancy, which we're going to discuss. So now we're going to look at those risk factors which cause high levels of unopposed estrogen. So we've got obesity, because the adipose tissue results in the conversion of androgens to estrogen. So with a lot of adipose tissue, you will have a lot of estrogen. We've also got patients who have many menstrual cycles. So of course, the more menstrual cycles you have in your lifetime, then the more estrogen is being exposed to the endometrium. So in cases where you've got early menarche, which is the age of the first menses, late menopause, or nulliparous women, these patients will have many menstrual cycles and therefore are at an increased risk. Next, we have polycystic ovarian syndrome. So basically over here, the ovary is full of cystic follicles, which are all secreting estrogen. Now, most of these follicles don't ovulate, so the corpus luteum, which secretes progesterone, is not formed. So excess estrogen is secreted without being balanced out by progesterone. Okay, so we've also got estrogen secreting tumors, such as granulosa cell tumors of the ovaries. Estrogen only HRT is also a risk factor because a progesterone is not given as part of the HRT regimen to balance out the estrogen. So you have excess unopposed estrogen. Tamoxifen can also result in excess estrogen. So basically, tamoxifen is a breast cancer medication which blocks estrogen receptors in the breast but activates estrogen receptors in the uterus. Other risk factors include diabetes, hypertension and low physical activity which have also been linked to endometrial cancer. Finally, we've got a genetic condition called hereditary non-polyposis colorectal cancer which is also known as Lynch syndrome which is high risk for developing colon cancer and endometrial cancer. There are also some protective factors for developing endometrial cancer. So like we said before, many menstrual cycles increase your risk. So over here, few menstrual cycles will act as a protective factor. And we can see this in multiparous women and women on the oral contraceptive pill. Exercise was also found to be protective as well as smoking. Okay, great. So now before moving on with the discussion of endometrial cancer, we need to talk a bit about endometrial hyperplasia. Endometrial hyperplasia is basically a premalignant disease, which can eventually result in endometrial cancer. So essentially, this is excessive proliferation of the endometrium. And again, this is caused usually by excessive unopposed estrogen levels. There are two types of hyperplasia, so we've got simple hyperplasia and complex hyperplasia, and here we're going to take a look at their histology. Simple hyperplasia has a cystic branching pattern with normal stroma to gland ratio. Complex hyperplasia has crowded and closely opposed glands, so it has a high gland to stroma ratio. This has a higher risk of progressing into cancer. Now, when we talk about atypical hyperplasia, we are saying that there are atypical cells, so abnormal cells, which have abnormal nuclei. It is these atypical cells which increase the risk of progression to malignancy. So you could have simple hyperplasia with atypia or complex hyperplasia with atypia, and both of these carry a greater risk of developing into malignancy. 
Okay, so that's a short side note on endometrial hyperplasia. Now, there are also different types of endometrial cancer. We've got type 1, which is the most common, referred to as endometrioid carcinoma, and this includes around 80% of endometrial cancers. It occurs as a result of unopposed estrogen and in patients with a high BMI. It is low grade and has a relatively good prognosis. On the other hand, type 2 endometrial cancer refers to a serious form of carcinoma. This is actually secondary to endometrial atrophy. It is high grade and has a poor prognosis. Okay, great. So now how do endometrial hyperplasia and endometrial cancer typically present? So the classic presentation is of postmenopausal bleeding. So this refers to bleeding after one year of not seeing any periods. So once menopause has been reached. 10% of women presenting with postmenopausal bleeding will in fact have endometrial cancer. These patients can also present with other forms of abnormal uterine bleeding, such as intermenstrual bleeding or heavy menstrual bleeding. Sometimes on a routine smear test, cesium can be identified, which may point towards an endometrial pathology. So a side note on cesium here. This is cervical glandular intraepithelial neoplasia and is basically a cytological result obtained from a smear test. So in the cervix, we have two types of cells. We've got squamous cells, which line the ectocervix, and we've got glandular columnar cells, which are present in the endocervix. Both of these can be abnormal, resulting in cesium. So when abnormal columnar cells are present, this may pour towards an endometrial abnormality, since this epithelium is continuous with the endometrium. Now, to diagnose endometrial cancer, we first perform a transvaginal ultrasound to take a look at how thick the endometrial lining is. So usually, an endometrial thickness greater than 4 mm in a postmenopausal woman is considered to be thick, and therefore we need to carry out further investigations, which involves taking a sample. So an endometrial sample can be taken using a pipelle. But the gold standard for the diagnosis of endometrial cancer is by performing a hysteroscopy DNC, where we take a look at the lining and take a sample which is then sent to the lab. If we have confirmed endometrial cancer, then we need to stage the patient appropriately and perform some imaging, such as a chest X-ray and MRI. So essentially staging refers to how much the cancer has spread, and we tend to use the FIGO staging. So in stage 1, the lesion is still confined to the uterus. In 1A, you've got less than one half of the myometrium, which is involved, and in 1B, you've got more than one half of the myometrium invaded. In stage 2, the lesion has spread to the cervix, but has not gone beyond the uterus. In stage 3, the tumour has now spread beyond the uterus. So in 3A, the tumour has invaded the serosa or adnexae, in 3B, the tumour has spread to the vagina and possibly the parametrium too. In 3C1, the pelvic nodes are involved, and in 3C2, the paraortic nodes are involved. In stage 4A, the tumour has spread to the bladder or bowel, and in 4B, there is distant metastasis. Great. So, I'll look at the treatment now. So, for simple hyperplasia, we treat with progestogens. This can be an oral progestogen, or an intrauterine system, such as the levonorgestrel intrauterine system called the Mirena. Now, if the characteristics of endometrial hyperplasia are pointing towards high risk for malignancy, such as atypical hyperplasia, then a hysterectomy is performed. Now, with endometrial cancer, if it is still in the stages 1 or 2, a hysterectomy is performed, but if the disease is more advanced, the patient is given radiotherapy. Great. So that's all you need to know about endometrial cancer. Now we're going to move on to congenital uterine abnormalities. So to understand these congenital uterine anomalies, we need to take a look back to embryology. So during the third week, the embryo will consist of three layers, the ectoderm, mesoderm and endoderm. And between the third and fifth week, the mesoderm will differentiate into paraxial mesoderm, intermediate mesoderm, and lateral plate mesoderm. 
And over here, we are interested in the intermediate mesoderm because this is where the reproductive system arises from. The intermediate mesoderm gives rise to the urogenital ridge. Now, the urogenital ridge is further divided into the gonadal ridge, which gives rise to the ovaries or testes, the nephrogenic cord, which gives rise to the kidneys, and the paramesonephric or malarian ducts, and the mesonephric or wolfian ducts. So, here we can see the gonads, the paramesonephric ducts, and the mesonephric ducts. The paramesonephric ducts give rise to the fallopian tubes, uterus, and upper two-thirds of the vagina, while the mesonephric ducts give rise to the ureters, the epididymis, vas deferens, and seminal vesicles. Now, hormones produced by the female will result in the paramesonephric ducts to persist and the mesonephric ducts to regress. The paramesonephric ducts will grow further and eventually fuse in the midline at around 10 weeks, with a septum at first. Then the septum is resorbed at around 20 weeks. So now that we have this background knowledge on the embryology, we can take a look at the anomalies to understand in which stage the error has occurred to know which process has gone wrong. So, first of all, we've got errors in effusion. So we've got a bicornuate uterus where we have a partial fusion of the ducts creating an indent in the fundus. With a unicornuate uterus, there is an asymmetric lateral fusion defect with the other duct being poorly developed. Didelphis is when two malarian ducts fail to fuse, causing duplication of reproductive structures. Now there can also be errors of septal resorption. So a septate uterus has a normal external surface of the fundus with incomplete resorption of the septum between the two malarian ducts. An arcuate uterus is when there is a slight midline septum with minimal and broad fundal cavity indentation. Great, so these are the most important congenital abnormalities you should know. Good, so that's the end on my two videos on uterine pathologies. I hope that they were helpful. Thank you.